nuts for pursuing like, only yeah, VR. You're gonna go out of business, this is not gonna be a thing, and it's just over time, the percentage of people calling us insane is going down, which, yeah. <laughs> which is a good sign that we're on the right path. As soon as I just even thought about our game in VR, I hadn't even actually held an Oculus at that point. I was like, this is gonna be cool. I put on the headset and uh, I was blown away. You can actually control it with your mind to tell them to walk around, to dance, to fly. And so putting it on and still having that, like, that new VR shock of like, whoa, I'm in another place. And then to have on top of that, whoa, I'm in another place. And I built it. Like, we made this space. And I yelled so loud. And that feeling is that you've been taken, teleported somewhere else, and if you then feel powerful and important and in control in that space, it kind of makes you giddy. There's something in your brain that just triggers and goes like, whoa, I couldn't experience this in real life and yet here I am. We're on this edge of innovation that hasn't happened for decades. It feels like we're inventing a new language. Let's do stuff that like would literally be impossible with a regular screen. People are like, oh, what is, what are we gonna do in VR? It's like, you're gonna do everything in VR. This is the year when the world gets to see it. And the world will see it, and they're going to see it, and they're going to believe it. And they're not going to be able to stop talking about it. You can say, hey, I'm the one that invented that thing that didn't exist. That's something that most people can't claim. That's a great line on your resume. Or a tombstone. Virtual reality is the thing, right? That is the, that is the, the future. That is the keystone of like, once we reach virtual reality, future has been achieved. Well done. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO of Oculus, Brendan Arib. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Oculus Connect 3. This is the third time we brought this community together, all under one roof, and it's our largest event yet. There are more than 2,500 people here today and thousands more streaming online, right on the live connection, right now. So we have over 40 talks and workshops for you and more than 30 brand new VR experiences, many of which no one has ever seen before for you to try right here at the show. You'll learn from engineers and designers on the cutting edge of VR, and of course, you'll go hands-on with the latest hardware and tons of new content. Thank you guys for being a part of this. So a lot has happened in the community over the last 12 months. We've gone from dev kits and prototypes to bringing millions of people into VR. Millions of people around the world have got to try virtual reality. And at the heart of it all, what brings VR to life is the content that you create. The work that you've done has led to hundreds of incredible VR experiences on the Oculus platform. From gaming and entertainment to education and science, the ecosystem is taking off thanks to you. Thank you. So we have a lot to share today, and I mean a lot. Our latest developments in hardware, software, content, and more. To get started, I'd like to welcome Mark Zuckerberg. How are we doing this morning? So before we get started, I just want to say how, how meaningful it is that you are all here with us today. You know, I'm looking around, and I see a lot of people that we've worked with for a long time. Uh, I see a lot of people who are in virtual reality right now. And, uh, and, and I see a lot of people who have been in the industry for a really long time uh, making this happen. And you know, you're all the reason why virtual reality has gotten to the point it's at today. So thank you so much, and thank you for being with us today. Now, we all share this big goal together. 
we're here to make virtual reality the next major computing platform. And at Facebook, this is something that we're really committed to. You know, I I'm an engineer, and I think a key part of the engineering mindset is this hope and this belief that you can take any system that's out there and make it much, much better than it is today. Right, so anything, whether it's hardware or software, a company, a developer ecosystem, you can take anything and make it much, much better. And as I look out today, I see a lot of people who share this engineering mindset. And we all know where we want to improve and where we want virtual reality to eventually get. Right? It's this feeling of real presence, like you're really there with another person uh, or in another place. We want hardware that's a uh, lighter form factor and smaller that can do both VR and AR, that can do eye tracking and mouth tracking and hand tracking and so much more. Uh, we want software that can let us experience anything, uh, that can help us learn anything with new kinds of education content, and can let us do things that it wouldn't be so easy to do uh, today, like floating through space and uh, without gravity. Now, I, I want to start today by talking about where we are today as an industry, uh, taking stock of, of the progress that we've made. So our industry has made more progress in the last couple of years than I think any of us could have really hoped for. Right? When we bought Oculus a couple years back and planted a flag in the ground that we thought that, that virtual reality was going to be the next major computing platform, at that point, no one had ever shipped a modern consumer virtual reality product. Uh, no one had ever seen touch or hand presence. And at that point, certainly, no one would have guessed that just now, two years later, there would be more than a million people actively using virtual reality products. So now, following this, uh, this development that this whole community has brought, uh, we have a lot more folks investing in virtual reality. Not just in this community, but we have Samsung investing in virtual reality. We have Valve and HTC investing in virtual reality. Now we have Google and others. So this is really happening. And we have a lot to be excited about. Now, the first step for getting virtual reality out into the world is, is getting the basic hardware out there. And, and this is happening, right? And it's happening, I think, at a faster rate than uh, any of us had really expected. And, you know, we, we had a little bit of a slow start earlier this year on Rift, but now that's rolling out quickly. And we're going to get touch in your hands by the end of this year, too. So we're excited about that. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about these products and talking about hardware, because there's a lot more innovation in hardware to go to get to that ultimate experience that we all want. But it's also true that with the hardware we have today, it's already possible to build some pretty amazing experiences. So what I want to focus on today here is what I think we need to do in the next phase of developing virtual reality, which is building great software experiences. Now, I want to tell you a fun story quickly before we get into this. Uh, one of the fun parts of my job is that whenever a president or a prime minister from another country comes to the US, they often want to come to Facebook to see what new technology we're working on. And that means that I get to be the first person who's ever showed them virtual reality. And you know, they usually don't have much time, because you know they're running a whole country. But uh, <laughs> so I get to show them a few things. Uh, you know, I normally take them into Toy Box. We play some ping pong in, in zero gravity. Uh, we'll make a sculpture in Medium. I'll show them a 360 video. And you know, depending on what kind of a leader it is and what their culture is, maybe we'll play a first-person shooter, too. <laughs> <laughs> and to the person, by the time the demo is done and we take the headset off, they're just amazed, right? And they don't want to leave. And so I actually had this one situation where the wife of a prime minister was yelling at her husband that he had to leave, go catch the plane to go home. Uh, and he was just sitting there like, I was told there was a dinosaur. I demand to see the dinosaur. Here's the dinosaur. <laughs> right. So, so uh, you know, the magic of VR software is this feeling of presence, right? The feeling that you're really there with another person or in another place. And helping this community build this software and these experiences is the single thing that I am most excited about 
when it comes to virtual reality. Because you know, this is what we do at Facebook. Right? We build software and we build platforms that billions of people use to connect with the people and things that they care about. Now, when I was in college getting started thinking about all this, I actually studied both computer science and psychology. Now, I, I wasn't there for very long, but uh, <laughs> early on in psychology, you, you do learn uh, that the brain is specifically wired uh, to care about people first. Right? That's why uh, we have all these centers of the brain that are just about processing and understanding people, you know, whether that's uh, understanding faces or language or emotions or relationships. Uh, that's why babies can stare at faces for you know, what seems like an unlimited amount of time, because there's so much there to take in and learn about. That's why you know, if something moves on that side of the room, uh, you may not notice it, but if you're talking to someone and they move their eyebrow one millimeter, uh, you're going to notice that, right? Because that means that they're conveying a different emotion, and that's a really important signal for you to pick up, right? So think about this for a second. Um, you know, look around the room, right? What we're wired to see, uh, no one looked around the room when I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's try that one again. Look around the room. Um, you know, what we're wired to see is, isn't the chairs or the walls, right? It's, it's the people who are, who are here, right? Um, that's, that's how our brains work. And that's why I've spent my life trying to build technology that puts people at the center of the experience. Now, when I was first getting started thinking about Facebook, I, I looked around at the internet, it was 2004, and I realized that you could find almost any type of content that you wanted on the internet. Games, news, music, movies, uh, reference materials, almost anything. Except for the one thing that we all care the most about, which is what's going on with uh, the people that we care about around us. So, uh, so I built that, and um, <laughs> it's going pretty well so far. <laughs> there, there are about 1.7 billion people using Facebook today. And you know, I think that that just underlies this point that you know, we really want our software to, to be built with people at the center of it. You know, and in fact, today, when you look at the top mobile apps, Four of the top six of the mobile apps are, are our social apps that are about communication and not people. Right? I mean, you pull up your phone and you see a grid of apps. And you know, that is not really how we're, we process the world. Right? It's not really how we think. And I don't think that that's how uh, the next platform is going to work. So you know, think about this for a second. Uh, you know, think about an everyday experience that you have, right? like going out to dinner with your friends. Right? If, if that were organized, in the way that we organize our phones today, right around where every task or every part of that experience is uh, in a completely different place, so you have to do something different to get there, then you know, first you'd, you'd start off, you'd be in a room eating by yourself, probably. And then you know, if you want to talk to your friends, you'd have to stop eating and get up and go to a different place. Uh, and if you wanted to take a photo with your friends, you'd all have to get up and walk to a different room together. So you know, that's not how we live. right? That's not how we process the world, and you know, that isn't going to be how virtual reality works. So virtual reality is the perfect platform to put people first because of presence, right? because you feel like you're really there in another place with people. Right? You have the space where you can do anything you want. Right? You can play a game. Uh, you can do work. But more importantly, you are free to explore. And you're probably going to end up doing a lot more things together than you would if every experience was its own app that you had to go into separately. Now, people first doesn't mean that every experience is going to be social, because it's not. Most aren't. But what it does mean is that we should build software and, and experiences that follow the way that, we, that, that our minds work and the way that we process the world. Right? So that means that. You know, every task that we're doing should be part of a, a broader experience. Now, I think that building this software platform and a lot of these experiences is a big part of the next phase of developing virtual reality and bringing it out into the world. But rather than just talk about it, I figured that we should show you what we're building. So let's go do that. All right. First live demo in VR. All right. We are in virtual reality right here at Oculus Connect. 
<laughs> hey guys, how's it going? Hey Mark, it's great to see you. Hey, hey Mark. You guys too, you know your avatars look a lot better than the last time that you showed me. <laughs> yeah, we actually have faces now and bodies and uh, we even look like ourselves. Yeah, you know, even though you're cartoons, it's pretty amazing that our minds can just automatically understand the facial expression so I can understand what you're feeling right now. Right. So we can actually make eye contact. Uh, our mouths move when we talk so we know who's speaking in the room. Uh, I can even make expressions. I can smile. I can look surprised. Oh. <laughs> I can look confused. Uh, You're making those can, sound effects right now. That's, that's me. <laughs> I can even laugh if you say something funny. Here, take a look at your own avatar. Whoa, why, why, why did you make me look like a young version of Justin Timberlake? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh... Uh, the over-the-top laugh is not part of the avatar system. All right. No, that, that's all me. Yeah. All right, so, so now that we're here, you know, the point of, of, of uh, being here is to talk about building a software platform that puts people first, right? So if, you know, if we were using a phone, we would have to pick what app or what task we wanted to do and go to that. But because we're in virtual reality, we're here together, and we have the space where we can just do whatever we want, right? So do you want to go somewhere? Yeah, let's. In fact, how about I take us to the bottom of the ocean? Sounds Beach. good. All right. Whoa. <laughs> sharks. Oh. <laughs> Those are sharks. All right. That's a lot of sharks. Oh <laughs> All right. How about we go somewhere else? How about we go to another planet, say Mars? Wait a second. Mike, didn't you say that was going to cost billions and uh, we'd all probably die? Mm, not in VR. <laughs> Phew. Welcome hmm. to Mars. Well, hmm, I don't think I'd want to live here. <laughs> All right, guys, how about we go somewhere where there's some more people? You know, that's kind of my thing. Um, what about Facebook offices? That great idea. Great. All right. Okay. okay. All right, here we are, back. Uh, back oh, on Earth. All right, so oh, here yeah, we are. This is, this is my, my office in the, in the, um, at Facebook. So, right on. All right, so, you know, the point of this and the reason why we're here is to talk about how you know, we have this space together in VR, and how we can go do anything that we want together. right? So uh, you want to play a game? Oh, that sounds sure. great. Let's try, uh, let's try a quick game of cards, huh? There we go, okay. two for you, two for you, and All right, what are we playing? Me. Let's just do a quick game of high card. Ready? Flip them over on three. One, two, three. Oh, oh, I win. There. Let's see. Oh, I, oh man. I, uh, nice. I barely ever won in demo practice, so, you know, I'm... We didn't plan that at all. <laughs> well, another game we can play might be chess. Now, I'll go first. Queen to center a board. All right, I'm not sure what to do with that. Uh, <laughs> for in, 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 in virtual reality, you can make any move you want, apparently, but all right. How about oh, here you go. Something completely different. You know, um, when I was in school, I actually used to fence. Oh. You got another one of these? Right. Uh, I can do one better. Check this out. I will just make my own. <laughs> draw this real quick like this. Oh, draw like so. I'm going to go like that. All right. I'm good. Ha ha. Swish, swish. Play, play. Ha ha. All right. <laughs> Look what I've got, guys. I think you win. All right, we, we surrender, we surrender. <laughs> oh, another thing we can do together would be just watch a simple video. Now, unlike on the phone, I can zoom this up to any size we'd like. Whoa. Check it there out, it's almost like our own private movie theater. <laughs> it's quite, awesome. the, quite the falcon you've got there, all right. <laughs> Hey, so I promised Priscilla that I would go home to check on our dog, Beast. You want to come with me? Sure. sure. All right. Yeah. Let's go do it. Sounds great. All right. Here we are. Check we were out. at my home, and, um, and there's Beast. Oh, there's Beast. Oh, he's yeah. adorable. He looks well, so happy. That's I great. I mean, he's got his ball. It's all good. Hey, I'm getting a call in Facebook Messenger. Dude, you could actually answer that call in VR. Take a look at your wrist. Whoa. Hey. Hi. How's it going? Good. Why do you look 
look like Justin Timberlake. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, how's Beast doing? Uh, he's great. Here, take a look. Um, he's just hanging out with his ball. Uh, he's doing well. But this is crazy. You know, you're dialed into virtual reality right now, and Beast has no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> he usually doesn't. Yeah, hey, do you mind if I, if I just put you here for a second? Sure, I'm in clinic, but my next patient's not here yet, so I have a minute. All right, cool, we'll hang out in virtual reality in between you treating real patients. All right, so, um, <laughs> hey, while we're here, do you want to, um, you want to take a, a quick uh, modern family selfie? Oh, I have yeah. just a tool for that. There you go. Yeah. Of course you have a selfie stick. <laughs> of course. All right, let's uh, do this. Oh, I've got to get the angle right. All right. All right, here, let's check out these photos. All right, which one, which one do you like? You know, we, we, get, we got to put one of these on Facebook. What do you think? Uh, right one? Let's do the right side, the one on the right. You know, I think this one might even be better. No, let's, all right, all right, let's stick with this. All right, Facebook, bam. There you go. Awesome. All right. All right. So, you know, this has been a great example, I think, of the type of experiences you can have when we're here together and we have this space and we can do anything we want. So nice job pulling this together, guys. It's amazing how much progress we've made. Hey, Thank thanks. you very much. All right. I should probably get back to the keynote, but I'll see you guys a bit later. See ya. All right. See ya, Priscilla. Take it easy. All right. All right, everyone, give it up for Mike and Lucy. So that's what an environment looks like where you have people first, and you can bring in any kind of experience that you want. Now, you know, not every experience in virtual reality is going to be social. As a matter of fact, most aren't. And we're really committed to helping this community build all kinds of different experiences. So that's why today I am proud to announce that we have already invested more than $250 million into this community to fund the development of all kinds of content, from games to media and more. So um, we're very proud of that. And we are excited to announce that we are committing another $250 million to fund even more content development from folks in this community. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. We're, we're really excited to, to support this. Now, we're also excited about supporting content beyond games. Right? One area that I'm personally really excited about is education. Right? And I think that education is going to be a really powerful example of the potential of VR. Already today, uh, about 10% of the experiences in the Oculus Store are education. So we're going to do two things. First, we're going to create a dedicated section of the Oculus Store for all of the education content and experiences that you guys create. And second, we're going to start a fund, an education fund, with $10 million to fund and support developers who are building education content for VR. So this is something that we're, we're really excited about. All right. Now, there is one more kind of software that I'm really excited to talk about today. And that's computer vision software. Because computer vision software can unlock an entirely new category of VR products. Now, one of the hardest problems today in computer vision is called inside-out tracking. Right? The idea is that you have your headset, and you have a couple of cameras on the headset, and you have computer vision software that's looking at the image that the cameras see to determine exactly where you are in a room down to a millimeter or two. And no one has gotten this to reliably work in virtual reality yet. Right? Even Rift, which does track your, your position as you move through space, uh, does it with a method called outside-in tracking, where you know, we put a camera on the desk, and it tracks your, your headset and your hands as you move through space. And that's great, but there's a limit, which is that it only works when you're sitting at your desk or, or at home. So today, 
there are two primary categories of virtual reality products. Right? There's mobile, uh, like Gear VR, which is great, and it's affordable, it's portable, you could take it anywhere with you that you want. Um, it's not quite as powerful as a PC, uh, and you, know, you, can, you can turn sideways around and look at the world, but without inside-out tracking, you can't actually move through space in it. But it's a great and affordable experience. The second category is PC VR, and that's like Rift, right? And that is the highest quality of virtual reality experience that you can get today. Uh, it's really powerful. It is powered by a, a high-powered computer, which means that it's a little bit more expensive, uh, and because you're tethered to the computer, uh, you can't really take it with you out into the world. So we believe that there is a sweet spot between these, right? A, a standalone virtual reality product uh, category that is, that is high quality and that is affordable and that you can bring with you out into the world because it's not tethered to a PC uh, and because it has inside out tracking so it can track uh, your position as you move through the world. So we're working on this now. And it's still early, so I don't, don't want to get your hopes up too much. It's, uh, um, <laughs> we, we, we have a demo, but we, we don't have a product yet. Um, but, but this is the kind of thing that we believe will exist uh, when you combine the kind of hardware innovation uh, that we're doing with Oculus and the kind of next generation software experiences and breakthroughs that we're talking about for the next generation of, of, of VR. So you know, we're making progress on this computer vision software that's going to enable this entirely new category of product. And I, I figured let's, let's take a look at, at where we are in developing this. We have, a, we have a, a prototype that, that, we, can, that we can show. Um, so, so that's why we believe that building great software experiences is going to be the key to unlocking the next phase of virtual reality and, and going towards this ultimate goal. Right? We're going to build a software platform that puts people first. We're going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into all kinds of different content for you to build, uh, whether it's games or different types of media or education content. And we're going to continue making progress on computer vision until we can unlock this completely new category of virtual reality product. Now, there's a saying in technology that it's often easier to predict what the world is going to be like 20 years from now than it is to predict uh, what the world's going to be like three years from now. Right? And I think we all know in virtual reality what the world's going to be like 20 years from now. It's going to be the next major computing platform. So the real question is, what do we need to do over the next three years or next few years uh, to help make that possible? And you know, we believe that the, the key for the next phase is building these great software experiences uh, to unlock all these different things. So that's why I'm so grateful that all of you are here with us today. And I'm so excited for what you're all building and what we're doing together. It is an honor to be on this journey with you. And now to talk more about our platform, I would like to introduce the co-founder and head of product for Oculus, Nate Mitchell. Good morning, guys. Welcome. So at Oculus, we start from a pretty simple premise, that we're all building this VR platform together. And this morning, I want to talk about a few of the platform investments that we're making to help you guys develop the next generation of groundbreaking VR experiences. So let's start first with audio. Audio is fundamental to establishing presence, and we've continued to push forward the state of the art. The Oculus Audio SDK is designed to let you create high quality, highly immersive audio experiences. It's fully cross-platform and works out of the box with Unity and Unreal. Now, one new feature I want to talk about this morning is ambisonic rendering. 
ambisonics are a way of creating a high quality ambient positional audio track for your audio content. You can think of it a bit like a skybox for your ears. Now, ambisonics are perfect for making someone feel like they're deep inside a rainforest and actually creating a rich 3D soundscape all around them. What's novel about our approach to ambisonics is that this leverages our existing world-class HRTF engine to spatialize the sound and give you a super high quality experience. Ambisonics are part of the latest version of the audio SDK, and you can get started with them today. Now let's talk about Unreal Engine. UE4 powers some of the absolute best content on the platform today, and it's one of the very easiest ways to get started building for VR. Now, we've been close partners with Epic Games since the very beginning of Oculus, and we've used Unreal for countless Oculus projects. So what we want to do now is put the power of Unreal in the hands of every Oculus developer. So I'm excited to announce today that Oculus is going to cover Unreal Engine license fees for any app sold through the Oculus Store for up to the first $5 million gross revenue. So this makes getting started with Unreal Engine and Oculus effectively free. We cannot wait to see what you guys create. So Unreal and Unity are part of our vision for making everyone a VR creator. But there's another big initiative that I wanted to talk about this morning. To date, VR development has really been primarily focused on native apps. And native apps are going to continue to push the boundaries of performance, fidelity, and immersion. But there's another content ecosystem that we think is super important. And it's a content ecosystem of simple VR experiences that are based on web technology and are accessed via a web browser. You can think of this ecosystem as the VR web. And it's going to be huge for a number of reasons. First, the VR web is going to be one of the easiest ways to develop and share your content. With a few lines of JavaScript, you can create a VR experience and instantly share it with anyone in the world. No installs, no long downloads. And because your content can be accessed through a browser, your reach isn't going to be limited to just people with VR devices. Your audience includes anyone with a laptop or a phone. This is going to ultimately lead to an exponential growth in the amount of VR content that's out there. And everyone in the future is going to have their own VR destination on the web. So I want to give you guys sort of a sense of the sorts of experiences that you can build today with this technology. It is still early days, but we've got two demos for you uh, to share. So both of these experiences are built on WebVR, which is an evolving industry standard that interfaces VR systems with browsers. Let's take a look. So first up, we've got a demo that lets you I'll move over here. Uh, let's you check out hotels uh, using 360-degree photospheres. These photospheres were given to us by Oyster.com. And what you can see is that we can embed all sorts of contextual information in the scene, restaurant reviews, menus. Um, this is extremely easy to build. This demo you can imagine building in just a few days, actually. So let's take a look at something a little bit flashier, a little, something that feels a little bit more VR. This is a car configurator built by Renault in partnership with Little Workshop. So you can imagine receiving a URL, hitting that link, and instantly being teleported inside this car. This is a really neat demo. You can actually configure the car live and see it. And this, is all, this, all, this can all run at 90 FPS on Rift. So this is going to be big. And we want to talk about a few of the ways that we're going to help you guys build web VR content. So first, we're working on a new framework that makes it really easy to create these sorts of VR experiences for VR browsers. This new framework is called React VR. So React is built on the foundation React VR is built on the foundations of React, which is one of the most popular web and mobile app frameworks that's available today. And it lets web developers create these simple web VR experiences really, really easily. And again, publish and share them to the world. Now the question becomes, how are you guys going to access this new frontier of web content? Well, I'm excited to announce that Oculus is developing a VR browser, codenamed Carmel. 
Carmel runs on any Oculus device. It's highly integrated with our uh, tech stack, and it's fully optimized and designed for VR. We're going to be releasing a developer preview for Carmel very soon and react alongside it. I personally believe this is the beginning of something really, really big. So we've talked a lot at Oculus over the years about how we believe social is going to be one of the primary platform pillars of VR. And avatars are a really important part of that vision. We've been prototyping and researching social VR experiences for the last few years. Toybox was one of the very first public prototypes. And I still meet people all the time who tell me that the reason they quit their jobs and got into VR was the magic of social presence that they experienced inside Toybox. So today, we want to enable social presence at the platform level. I'm excited to introduce Oculus avatars. This is a brand new avatar system that's designed for the Oculus platform. And it delivers true social presence. It's powerful and flexible, letting you create a persistent identity that you can take with you anywhere across the platform and that reflects your own unique style. We're also going to be releasing an avatar SDK. Now, the SDK makes it easy to integrate touch interactions into your game and additionally, true hand presence. And because it brings people's avatars into your experience, people can actually feel like themselves and easily recognize their friends. And I promise you, recognizing a friend's avatar in VR for the first time is a magical experience. Now, to show you a bit of that magic, I'd like to welcome Mike Howard, product manager for Oculus Avatars, to give us a demo. Good morning. So Mike's going to give us a demo of the avatar editor, which is going to be accessible via Oculus Home. Now, anyone can create an Oculus avatar, but Mike's going to go ahead and show us the touch interface today. Mike, Thanks. do you want to take it away? Thanks, Nate. Morning, everyone. Welcome to the avatars editor. This is where you'll customize your avatar from over a billion permutations of options. I'm going to make myself a new avatar today. Nate's going to help. And uh, let's dive right in. So first things first, I've got the hairstyle and face shape of my avatar. This isn't quite me. So I'm going to go for something a little bit. I think that's the look I want to go for. What do you think, Nate? That looks good. Maybe we can get a close up. Yeah. That's one heck of a jawline. Thanks, man. <laughs> All right, next up, materials. Uh, sorry, um, the outfit. You've got eyewear and clothing options to choose from, and there's a huge catalog. So, uh, Nate, what was the eyewear that you go for? So my avatar's been wearing the aviators mostly, which I think I see right there. Oh, these guys? Yeah. Nice. All right, let's try putting them on. Oh, yeah. That's a pretty cool look. It's a good look. What about clothing? I mean, we could go formal, we could go casual. It's Oculus Connect 3. Let's go with something formal. Really? But Zuck's wearing a t-shirt. Let's stick with something formal. OK. <laughs> Fine. So uh, let me see now. I'm just going to scroll through some of these. We've got some sci-fi options. We've got some lovely dresses. I'm going to go for this, uh, got this scarf guy. we got the bow tie guy. What do you think? I love the scarf, but I would recommend the bow tie. Bow tie? All right. Let's go for the bow tie. Nice. Look That's a look. sharp look. All right, now finally we have material options, and there's a whole host of textures and colors that you can personalize your avatar with. I'm going to pull a couple out here. We've got this uh, metallic thing, and uh, yeah, maybe this, this two-tone. I like this. Let's try metal first. So, Wow, OK. I think I look a bit too much like an Oscar. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm going to try the other one. Let's try this guy. Oh, yeah. That looks great. I'm going to take my avatar and go hang out in VR. I'll pass it back to you, Nate. Thanks, Mike. So Oculus avatars are going to be launching on Rift at Touch Launch. And they're uh, here at the show for you guys to try today. We also have them coming to mobile in early 2017. The avatar demo that you just saw is here. You can try it. I think it's right out in the lobby. So we really look forward to seeing what you guys create. Now, avatars are just one part of how we're helping you guys build the most social VR platform ever. And now to tell you a bit more about our vision for social, please welcome Lauren Vector. 
dag. Over a billion permutations of avatars. That's pretty cool. Avatars are going to form the foundation of your identity in VR, enabling you to represent yourself in social interactions. Earlier, Mark shared with you our vision for what will be possible in the future with social VR. The real magic of social is hanging out together with friends and family, no matter where they are. Imagine a world where you can connect to the people you care about, even when you can't be physically present with them. Sit on the couch next to your best friend and hear about their day, even if they're a thousand miles away. This is the first time, the very first time, that technology has made this level of social presence possible. Enjoying VR together with the people you care about is one of the most meaningful experiences that VR can offer. We're building toward that social future today and giving you all of the tools you need to make amazing social experiences. Earlier this year, we shipped an Invites API that allows a user to invite friends into a multi-user app. And we've built matchmaking that makes it easy for developers to build multiplayer games. Over 80 apps on our store leverage these services, games like Blaze Rush, Project Cars, and Dragonfront. We've made big improvements to these features since launch, and we'll have even more coming over the next few months. Mark and I share a vision for where social VR is going. And what you saw earlier was an illustration of that vision. But what about today? Today, we're taking the next steps towards the social future. You've wanted to be able to talk to your friends while in VR, so I'm excited to announce Parties. With Parties, up to eight people can talk while you're in VR, no matter what you're doing across the platform. You could access this right in home or from Universal Menu. I could easily invite Nate to my party, and immediately we could talk about where we want to go together in VR. A group voice call is amazing, but why stop there? What if I want to meet up with Nate and actually hang out with him? This is virtual reality after all. There's no reason that we can't actually be in the same space together. We've built a way to make that happen. Today, we're excited to announce Oculus Rooms. When you start a party with friends, with a single click, you can join a virtual, physical space together. There's a bunch of different things to do in the room itself. You could watch TV with some of the best videos available on Facebook. You could listen to music with friends. And you could play mini games with up to eight people. Rooms is the central station of our social apps that lets you easily move between them as a group. When you gather your group around the app launcher in Rooms, you can seamlessly jump into another social app together. As a developer, if you integrate with our coordinated app launch API, you'll benefit from allowing users to join your app with friends. And look at all of the options we have to explore together. All of these awesome apps have already integrated our simple new coordinated app launch API so that friends can jump into them from rooms. Both parties in Oculus Rooms will be shipping on gear in a few weeks and early next year on Rift. The API to integrate will be available as part of our platform SDK. We can't wait to make it easy for people to enjoy VR together. This is just the beginning, and we're looking forward to seeing the amazing social experiences that you, our developers, will create next. Now, I'd like to welcome back Brendan to tell you more about the future of Rift in Touch. Thanks, Lauren. All right, are we ready to talk about Rift in Touch? Rift and Touch were designed from the ground up to deliver the best VR experience. 
the product that we, as enthusiasts, developers, and gamers wanted to exist. We focused on making sure it was comfortable, that it delivered a super amount of immersive experience, and that it was revolutionary, with hand presence that only touch can deliver. So let's dive into the software. We shipped six major releases since launch, each packed with new innovations and optimizations, plus full support for Unity and Unreal, so everybody can dive right in and get started. Recently, our focus has been around enabling touch and optimizing performance. We created a new input API that lets you target multiple classes of input, remotes, game pads, or touch controllers. When you write to this API, we take care of making the equivalent devices work. So anyone can pick up and use touch to play a game that was designed for gamepad. This makes it really easy. With one API, we support all three devices. We also have an advanced haptics API. In addition to turning vibration on and off like a traditional gamepad, it lets you send a custom waveform that modulates the vibration to produce these really cool tactile effects on touch. You'll be able to feel the gun kick or actually feel the tennis ball hit your virtual racket. It takes immersion to the next level. So we just introduced the Guardian system. This lets the user set up their play space. And with the new Guardian API, you can query the dimension and customize the experience. So you can bring all the objects into the play space so the user doesn't reach out and potentially bump into anything. This is really important for safety, especially with touch. So these are just a few of the new APIs that we've introduced. Now, let's take a look at performance. VR is more demanding than any other platform. Traditional video games usually run around 30 frames per second with some fluctuation, and that's fine for PCs and consoles, but not in VR. In high quality VR, apps must hit 90 frames per second. Period. Missing frame rate causes jutter and ends up kind of ruining the experience. It can even make you uncomfortable. So we can't miss frame rate. Our goal is to deliver the very best VR, to help you deliver the very best VR. So earlier this year, we launched Asynchronous Time Warp, a technology that we created to, in, to reduce jutter and deliver consistent low latency. We think of it as frame rate insurance. It fills in the pothole if the app drops a frame. So we're about to get a little technical here. Here's how it works. So the app's going along rendering at 90 frames a second. When the app doesn't have enough time to finish rendering, instead of dropping a frame, Time Warp kicks in, grabs the previous frame and the most recent head orientation, and it warps it into place. And it creates this new synthetic frame, this time warped frame and then the app continues to go along rendering. Our stats show that without time warp, apps would drop more than 11% of their frames. But with time warp enabled, that goes down to just 0.2%. That's a 50x reduction in glitches. This is a massive improvement and really helps deliver a great experience. Unfortunately, it's not a silver bullet. Time Warp works great for looking around, for head orientation, but it doesn't work for positional movement. So if you're moving your hands in the scene, or if there's an object moving around, or an animation, or maybe the entire scene is moving, you might still experience jutter if the app misses a frame. So today, we have a brand new innovation, something no one has ever done before, that fixes positional jutter. We call it Asynchronous Space Warp. <laughs> okay, so here's how this works. So Space Warp takes the app's two previous frames. It analyzes the difference, and it calculates the spatial transform to extrapolate and generate a new synthetic frame. Everybody follow that? <laughs> Easy stuff. So, with Space Warp, it now solves for head translation, for moving objects, even the entire scene. 
So when you're moving your hands in the scene, you won't have judder. You won't have ghosting images. Here's the trick. Space warp reduces the app's frame rate down to 45 frames per second. Half rate. It then uses a synthetic image every other frame to still display at 90 frames per second. So it frees up the bandwidth on the computer so that it can run at 45 per second, stably, but still display at 90. So while there's no replacement for native 90 hertz rendering, no replacement, Space Warp does make it easier for lower end machines to power VR. And this is another breakthrough. So there's lots of brilliant engineering, yeah. This is, a, this is a big deal. So there, there's lots of brilliant engineering under the hood to make this happen. It's built into the Oculus runtime, and it works automatically. Every single app on the platform benefits from it. So now that we have Space Warp, we're introducing a minimum spec. This will expand the audience. With lower CPU and GPU requirements, people can get into VR at a lower cost on a wider range of hardware. So we've worked really closely with our partners, especially NVIDIA and AMD. They've really helped out, both on Time Warp and on Space Warp. And I want to give a big thank you to everybody at NVIDIA and AMD. Thank you, guys. Now, we've also been working closely with machine vendors. And I'm excited today to share with you that CyberPower has a new machine, a new AMD-based MinSpec PC for $499. PC VR has never been so affordable. That's half the cost that we introduced PC VR last year. That's a really big deal. So now let's jump back to the Oculus Ready program that we created to bring people the very best VR. Last year, we introduced this program, and we partnered with some of the world's top PC makers to certify their machines against our recommended spec. We brought each of these machines into the office, and we ran them through hundreds of tests to make sure they were fully compatible and totally optimized so that you'd have a great experience all you need is an Oculus-ready machine and a Rift, and you're good to go. We started with six partners and 11 machines. Over the last year, we've grown this program to 11 partners and more than 40 machines. And like I said, this spec started around $1,000 last year. You can now get in for under $700. The costs keep coming down. PC VR is more affordable than ever. So I love attending hackathons and seeing students building the future. The energy and the creativity is just awesome. There's only one problem. Whenever I walk in and see this sea of students all hacking away, they're all using laptops. There's usually one or two desktops for that super enthusiast VR developer somewhere in the crowd that I have to hunt out and try to find. Uh, but it's pretty rare. So we're never going to convince everybody to buy a desktop just for VR. So we need to bring great VR to laptops. For the first time, we've certified laptops from four top OEMs, and many more are coming. Within years, <laughs> within years there'll be hundreds of Oculus-ready laptops. Again, big thank you to NVIDIA for all the work they're doing, especially on enabling laptops to power VR. So now let's talk about the Rift headset. We spent a lot of time focusing on comfort and ease of use, from the cloth wrap and the removable facial interface to the rigid strap system that helps balance out the weight and prevent the whole headset from pulling on your face and the fully integrated pair of headphones that deliver really high quality audio. So if you've ever used VR without integrated audio on the PC, you know it's not a great experience. It can be a bit of a nightmare to deal with all the cables, 
you put the headset on, then you have to take the separate pair of headphones and put it on. You might put them on backwards, you can't see. Uh, it's just a terrible experience. That's why we designed Rift from the beginning with fully integrated audio that's seamless, always there, and really high quality. Now we want to give you a new option for even deeper immersion, the Oculus earphones. <laughs> with advanced, they're awesome. With advanced noise isolation and drivers that are optimized for VR, these create an even deeper sense of presence. I'm telling you, the team has worked magic here. These sound as good as some of the highest end earphones in the world. We've actually compared them to $900 pair of earphones, and they sound as good, if not better. I'm sure lots of you will be comparing them, and I'm excited to see what you think. So Oculus earphones will be available for $49 and start shipping later this year. And for everyone here, you can pick up your own complimentary pair right after the keynote. <laughs> One more thing on audio and accessories. Available today, we're making the CAD and the guidelines for the audio connector and the facial interface open to it, to for anyone to develop their own Rift accessories. Now let's talk about touch. There's nothing like seeing your hands in VR. Pointing, social gestures, being able to pick up a tool, throw an object. Hand presence is a powerful way to make you feel like you're really there, that you're really in that experience, to naturally interact with the world. But to get this right, you need the right design. That was one of the key pillars for touch. We wanted the controller to just naturally fit in your hand, for you, be, for you to be able to use it for a long period of time without fatiguing, that you have to hold something. We wanted to make sure all the buttons were really high quality, that we could detect when you pointed or when you reached out and squeezed the grip to just pick up an object. And tracking had to be rock solid. These controllers are your interface to the virtual world, and we were determined to get this right. Let's take a look at the final version. Touch delivers the magic of VR input. Touch is $199 and starts shipping in volume December 6th. You'll be able to pre-order Touch online and in retail worldwide on October 12th, 10th, October 10th. We're also bundling two of our favorite titles with all pre-orders, VR Sports and The Unspoken. So Touch seamlessly integrates with your Rift system. It ships with a second sensor to give you a wider area. It also supports multiple sensor configurations. So in addition to the two sensor configuration in front of you that's great for a wide play space and most rooms, we support 360. So you can take one of the sensors and put it on the opposite corner of your play area. But the question most of you have been wondering, what about room scale? <laughs> will touch support room scale? Yes, it will.
we've created a room scale option using a third sensor for those of you who have the space. And extra sensors will be available for purchase for $79 and ship on December 6th. Okay, that covers the hardware. Now it's time for the content. The launch lineup for Touch is absolutely stunning. I can't wait to see what you guys think. To tell us more, please welcome Jason Rubin. Well done. Wow, what an incredible few years the VR game development community has had. In less than the time that it takes to put the average console title on the shelf, this community, you, have added over 500 games and applications to the Oculus platform. And these aren't just tech demos. This is a diverse library of fully featured titles with full narratives, deep gameplay, and great production values. But you don't have to take my word for it. The highest rated VR games and applications are on the Oculus platform. The content you're creating is driving VR forward. I hope you can all appreciate what you've achieved. Now, as Mark said earlier, Oculus is investing more than any other game developer or publisher on the planet in VR content. We've invested $250 million to date, and we're gonna spend a hell of a lot more. We believe this investment will continue to push innovation not only in the titles we fund, but also spill out in the ecosystem as a whole. And we think you can see that investment in the titles we launched. I'm absolutely positive you're going to see it in the titles that we launch in the future. Talking about the future, should we look at some unannounced touch titles? Now, 4A has been teasing their new game for the past month. As soon as people see touch, they say, where's my first person shooter? And Damage Core definitely has pushed the genre forward on GamePad. But developers don't rest. I'm happy to announce Arctica 1. 4A is one of the most storied PC developers out there, and they have taken their dark and gritty style and pushed VR forward. Let's check out Arctica 1. We've been punished by an endless winter for a generation, with no end in sight. Decades of technological progress could not prepare us for what happened. Vostok was first to feel it, and first to fall. For you, this is a job. For us, it is hope of another chance. Stay vigilant. Protect our home. Now, we're all familiar with Ready at Dawn Studios. They're famous for incredible, high-production AAA titles. They've been hard at work for over a year on what we believe is one of the single largest VR productions to date, Lone Echo. Lone Echo has both a long, immersive single-player story as well as a multiplayer five-on-five -five mode. And Lone Echo, ready at dawn, sets a new bar in visuals and presentation. Let's take a look. This is Captain Liv Rhodes, personal log entry for 7 of October 21, 26. Morning, sunshine. And how are we feeling today? Echo unit identified. Sensor array ahead. Please follow. I have a visual on the anomaly. It seems to be growing more unstable. Expect electrical interference. Jack, what happened? Energy spike from the anomaly. Okay, you'll need to cut through to access the fuse box. Jack, I need you. Find a fury transport and get back here now. Inbound on your location. Are you all right? Oh, thank God for you. It, it just switched on. Anomaly detected. 
What the hell? Jack, uh, you see... Good stuff. But that's not all. Another legendary game developer is bringing their immense talents to Rift and Touch. I'd like to introduce you to Nick Donaldson from Epic Games. Thanks, Jason. So, this is an amazing time in our industry. We're in the midst of a VR revolution, but there are parallel revolutions taking place in artificial intelligence, autonomy, and robotics. So to explore the potential of these exciting areas, Epic Games has spun up an internal research and development team to create an exciting new product. This is our vision of the future. Say hello to the latest member of the RoboReady family. Presenting the Tau Series 9. Every bolt, every component has been meticulously designed. Tau will obey any command. It lives to serve. Serve this. We are now getting reports of robot violence. Tau features convenient transport handles. Why did they have handles? As well as easily replaceable parts. Hey, I'm losing that and is built from impact-resistant materials. Booyah! Trouble-free service is guaranteed by our robo-recall program. Recall. Born from the DNA of the bullet train demo, it's coming to Oculus Touch for free in the first quarter of 2017. And it's available to play here right at the show. So please check it out and let us know what you think. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Now, Touch and Rift are doing more than just revolutionizing games. VR is also enabling new experiences and new art forms. For example, how many of you out there have ever wondered what it'd be like to be an astronaut? Well, NASA's help, we're gonna let you try just that with Mission ISS. Now, there's a reason that these graphics look so true to life. Astronauts are being trained using Mission ISS, the Rift, and Touch. And we're gonna release it to the community. Touch also enables new forms of creative expression. It's going to become commonplace for people to crea create art in VR. And we think that art is going to be like nothing you've ever seen before. We think Touch's true hand presence is going to be a leader here. And we have a bunch of new art tools to show, show you today. Medium is VR's first new sculpting tool. And it will be available at Touch Launch. It lets you step through a 2D window, grab your artwork, rotate it around, and walk around it. It's very different than looking through the 2D window as you do, did in the past. It actually lets you sculpt in, real, in the real world. It's a magical experience for both new artists and experienced artists. I'm happy to announce that Kingspray is also coming for Touch Launch. The team has implemented the Oculus social avatars, and it's now a co-op experience. Tagging is an incredible amount of fun solo, but when you bring along a friend, you just totally lose track of time. And we're happy to announce that we're going to be releasing Quill. Quill is the groundbreaking software that Story Studio is using to create its next short, Dear Angelica. Quill is groundbreaking because it not only lets you draw in space, it also lets you draw in time. And that allows you to create VR stories. Both Quill and Dear Angelica 
are going to be available at around Sundance. Now, that's a lot of art tool. Now, when Touch launches in December, it'll herald a sea change in VR content. There will be at least 35 pieces of content available at launch. And yes, we've added a few since the last time we talked, and we think that will continue to rise. And just like Rift Launch, we are incredibly proud of this lineup. Let's take a look at some of those titles now. Oculus has been amazed and humbled by our global developer community. We couldn't be more impressed with the titles that you've put on the shelf, and we can't wait to see what you do next. From games, to art, to education, to experiences, we believe that your imagination is going to connect people. And we take that mission very seriously. For that reason, we believe a very diverse group of creators is absolutely necessary to unlock VR's potential. And to tell you more about that, I'd like to invite on a stage my friend, Ebony P.A. Ramirez. Thanks, Jason. Two years ago, I experienced VR for the first time. I played Lucky's Tale. And although I kept nose diving into the water over and over and over again, I was completely consumed by this new world. That's when I knew I had to move from New York City to join Oculus. And since then, it's been incredible to see the work that's come from all of you, the community. But it's no secret that this community needs to be even broader. Virtual reality will only succeed if it represents and reflects a diverse ecosystem that speaks to different people and opinions. We want to see a wide variety of richer voices. We know that a platform that is built with diverse thought, personalities, perspectives, and imaginations, it's a much more engaging and dynamic one. This year, we took our first steps to removing the barriers of entry for new VR creators and kicked off Launchpad. We brought together more than 100 diverse developers of diverse backgrounds and trained them how to build great VR. Two of our participants have already shipped games. Found is an eight-minute interactive film that lets you discover the world around you. And Starship Disco, it lets you kill aliens to a funky beat. <laughs> so just remember, the bigger the beat, the bigger the game. This year, VR for Good offered tech, mentorship, and funding to help 10 nonprofits champion social good causes through compelling 360 videos. We'll be debuting these at Sundance next year. This is one of the programs that VR for Good is funding. Diversity matters, not just in the storytellers lending their voices to the medium, but to the audience as well, you. VR for Good will leverage the power of virtual reality break down barriers and open access so that anyone, anywhere, can truly be transformed into an experience and ultimately change the world we share. And it matters that we foster a community of support. Can I hear it for the women in VR, please? It 
it's so important that we create an environment where new VR creators can flourish and enjoy themselves. And thank you so much as we kicked off the, one of the largest meetups held here at OC3 last night. Thank you for joining us. But there's so much more that we can and will do. So I'm excited, enthusiastic to announce that Oculus is committing $10 million to diverse programs for VR. We're gonna increase funding for Oculus Launchpad, VR for Good, and create entirely new programs like the Diverse Filmmakers Project. This new program will fund women and underrepresented groups to accelerate production on their VR filmmaking, from 360 documentaries to interactive experiences made for touch. I can't hardly wait to get started. We've already seen how powerful and unique VR filmmaking can be, but it's gonna take a wide, inclusive, and collaboration of your work to get us there and truly see what's possible. We need diversity into the ecosystem today so that we can really build a future for VR that reflects the world we live in. These are the early days, and we have the opportunity to get this right. Thank you for joining me. When people first experienced the magic of mobile VR, they began to ask, what if? What if we could make our world feel a little smaller, a little closer, a little more connected? What if we could explore the human body from the inside out? What if we could travel without limits? What if we could understand what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes? What if we could jump higher, play harder, go farther, experience more? Together, we've expanded the definition of what's possible, and we're just getting started. Now the question is, where should we go next? Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Head of Oculus Mobile, Max Cohen. Good morning, developers and non-developers alike. Last year at Oculus Connect, we were in a very different place. We had a developer kit out, the Innovator Edition, and we had a lot of promises and optimism. But we weren't sure what was going to happen. We were asking you to commit your valuable time, energy, and money to developing for us but no one was really sure what would actually end up happening. A month later, we released the first consumer VR headset, and we followed that up with an updated headset in August of this year. Well, things have changed, because instead of just coming to you with optimism, now we actually have some data. We have, over, we have millions of Gear VR owners across 150 countries right now, and there's millions more who have tried it. You can actually demo Gear VR in over 15,000 retail locations in the United States alone. And the cool thing about this is that this has led to a really vibrant platform. We support 18 languages, and that can actually be a little bit intimidating for some of you, because you have to decide, do you want to commit your money and your time to localizing? Well, if you cover these five languages, that will give you a good start, because you can actually hit 80% of the market. But my favorite stat is that we actually have apps live in this store from developers that represent 55 countries, and that leads to a wide variety of content. And the thing about this is that the Oculus platform has come such a long way that when I was looking at this slide from last year, the grid was a lot smaller. Now, does anyone know how many apps are actually on screen here? It's 14 by 14. Quick math. Anybody? OK, it's almost 200. We actually have double that in this store. We have over 400 applications just for mobile on the Oculus platform, and we're on track to have close to 500 by the end of the year. And we all have our own favorite types of applications. For me, I love sports. NextVR is live streaming this keynote here today. And earlier this year, hundreds of thousands of people watched as they streamed the Masters and the Kentucky Derby. And my personal favorite is college basketball. 
And we all got to watch as in the final four back in uh, April as UNC lost. So that gave me some little like, extra uh, excitement there. But mobile VR can also be thrilling and flexible. How many of you have heard about the Six Flags? There's actually 12 roller coasters where you can r ride and get a Gear VR, and it's synced up to the cart. So as it goes around, you actually have the position moving through the experience. It's incredibly comfortable and thrilling. But VR can also be educational. I think there's a time not too far off where people won't be learning from textbooks. They'll be learning experientially. And this was a good example of that. There was actually a live stream from within an operating room where people at home got a glimpse into these high pressure simulations. But this particular use case is especially poignant for me. I grew up around hospitals. My father was an oncologist. My first job was actually when I was 13, working IT at a hospital. And the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland and Kind VR have teamed up to test the use of Gear VR to distract teenage patients with sickle cell disease from the often excruciating pain. Now, to continue innovation, to have all these great use cases, there needs to be a really strong partnership between you, Samsung, and us at Oculus. And Samsung is by far the most successful Android phone maker, and they are deeply committed to Gear VR and to working closely with us. This cooperation is going to make our ecosystem the biggest and best mobile VR system for many, many years to come. So we're going to bring the technology, and then you're going to bring the magic. But a lot of you are probably wondering, what are people actually doing in mobile VR? What kind of device is it? Well, as you expect, there's users who like some of the active VR content, and there's users who like the more passive VR content. And in fact, there's a big group. About three quarters of their time is spent in what we call active VR, which is rendered interactive content. But there's another group that spends a little bit more time on the platform, where three, at a three to one ratio, they're doing passive VR, Netflix, Hulu, Facebook 360, and some other things. But we really want to dig down and see what do the most engaged users do. So I'm going to take a quick poll. For our most engaged users, how many of you think they spend more time in active VR? Raise your hand. OK, so seems like good. How many of you think they spend more time in passive VR? Well, you're all wrong. They actually spend almost equal time in both active and passive VR. So I guess technically, the people who didn't raise their hand at all were right. So good job, <laughs> non-participants. And what this says to me is that no matter what kind of application you want to build, we're going to have an audience for you. And I think that's a really neat concept. So let's talk about how you actually build these apps. Uh, so John happens to be sitting right in front of me, which I think will be useful here. So whenever we get to the mobile SDK, I always want to bring the excitement and like, let's really talk about how fun the SDK is. So I went to John and I said, how can we make it exciting? And you said, we're really going to jazz it up this year, right? Yeah. I don't know if you heard it, but you just went, ha! So no, what John actually said is, the SDK is fundamentally unexciting, and trying to make it exciting is strenuously reaching and not advised. <laughs> that is word for word from an email from him. So he's right. It might not be exciting, but it's incredibly important. And that's why we put some of the best engineer, mobile engineers in the business on this problem. Because making applications run smoothly on a phone is not easy. So we're going to try to do the hard work to get you there. So there's two main things I want to highlight today. These aren't major shifts, because at this point, with a product that's out to millions of users, stability is key. But we want to talk a little bit about multi-view support and our Oculus Remote Monitor. So multi-view is one of the biggest, easiest performance gains that you can get. This is a new OpenGL extension that adds the ability to render to multiple elements of a 2D texture array simultaneously. Apologies to the non-developers, but the developers understood that, I promise. We implemented this in Oculus Video as a test, and we saw a 33% decrease in CPU usage. Now, to be fair, not every app will get those same kind of gains. It depends on the way your app is uh, designed. But we think this is going to give you a lot more headroom as you try to make your apps. And multi-view support's available now for native apps. And it will be coming to Unreal later this year, and then Unity in beta form. And there's lots of great performance tools out there, but there's usually some problems with them. They're either hardware specific, or they have very limited distribution, and they're hard to get. So we've been trying to address that with the Oculus Remote Monitor. This direct view into what's going on into your app will help you make decisions that will maximize your creativity while minimizing jitter. We've got lots of other great things, like Vulkan support coming early next year. But the whole idea here is that we've designed an SDK that allows you to push the boundaries of what's possible on a phone. And we did just that earlier this year with Dynamic Streaming. It first launched back in March at F8. And Dynamic Streaming allows people to see videos in effective resolutions of 6K at 60 frames per second. That's far more than what a phone's decoder can normally do. 
But that requires a lot of space and band that requires a lot of space and bandwidth to transmit as well, because you chop up this video into many different what we call viewports. And so a five-minute video can be as much as 16 gigabytes. But luckily, Facebook knows a thing or two about storing and transmitting data. This November, we've decided to release a beta version of a video SDK. And there's three main components here. Dynamic streaming will now be available as a service. We have full ambisonic audio support, and we'll have a sample app to help you get, it, get started. The, di <laughs> I'm guessing those people voted that video was more important. <laughs> the dynamic streaming service will allow you to take advantage of this cool technology from your own application. So whether you want to create custom UI, you're building your own video platform, anything you want to do, you can just make calls and we'll host the video, we'll pick up the bandwidth and the storage bill, and you'll get to do it however, wrapped however you want. Felix and Paul within and Jaunt will be the first partners to test this technology. <laughs> that was a little tepid, guys, come on. You can also add ambisonic audio, and that's going to give you a combination of eight different channels, and there's a stereo channel as well. And people will love the immersiveness that this adds to your video. And we'll provide a sample app that shows you exactly how you can implement this to best fit your needs. Now, the video SDK is going to make sure that you can deliver your highest quality videos to your customers. And consumers love video. In fact, they've spent over 5 million hours across 360, 360D, and more traditional sources. But videos is only half the equation. Gaming is incredibly important to VR. And this is where most of you really shine. There's just some activities that you want to do that require more than a touchpad or just a few buttons. And the, so last week, Microsoft announced that the Xbox wireless Bluetooth controller will have full Gear VR support in the coming months, which means many of your customers will already have the best controller in the business already at their homes. Now, whether you're actively playing a game or passively watching an experience, you often want to do things with friends. We've talk Mark talked about this, Lauren talked about this, Nate talked about this. We think social VR is going to be really huge. But a lot of times, and at least for the next few years, more often, you'll have more friends outside of VR than inside of VR at any given time. And so we're actually going to launch live streaming later this year so you can share your in-VR experience to anyone on Facebook. This is an example of what wands could look like. This is one of the most exciting multiplayer games on Gear VR right now from Nux Studios. And you'll be able to give people an exact view of what's going on inside the headset, broadcast live to all your friends, where they can comment, react, encourage you, or potentially discourage you. It is internet comments, after all. And you'll get a report at the end, and you'll know exactly how that performance was received. Now, coming up in a minute, I think there's an app that, as you guys, a game, as you guys see it, you're going to think this is going to be a big live stream hit. And so to talk a little bit about that, we have Ruth Bram coming to the stage to tell you about mobile content. Thank you. I am so excited about all of the new content coming to Gear as we are helping developers expand the boundaries of mobile VR. We now have thousands of developers from around the world building games and experiences for our platform. And to help the mobile VR ecosystem grow, we are working closely with you by providing millions of dollars of funding and engineering support. And this investment is paying off. Developers are making millions on our platform. So we are committed to helping you make more great titles. Therefore, we are continuing to fund third-party developers, creating that next wave of mobile VR games and experiences, and spending over $50 million this year. It's exciting. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. We are hoping that many of the talented pe people and PC developers in this room will also want to start building for mobile. Now, I want to share with you some of the most exciting titles on our platform. Turtle Rock, known for their innovative titles like Left 4 Dead and Evolve, have already created their first mobile VR experience with Face Your Fears. Check this out. You're laughing now. Wait till you see it in the gear. 
Face Your Fears is coming out this Halloween. And whether you're scared of heights, robots, creepy demon children, or even clowns, this experience is for you. <laughs> Speaking of clowns, who doesn't love Cirque du Soleil, Zarkana, and Curious? Right? I heard somebody was excited about it. <laughs> That's a start. Awesome. Well, Felix and Paul Studios and Cirque du Soleil have teamed up again, and they are back with Ka, placing you right there on stage in the middle of the performance. You don't want to miss this, and it's available today. After their first VR film success with Invasion, Baobab is back with an all-new animated story called Asteroids. Check this out. <laughs> The first look at Asteroids is available today with the full film call it co coming this holiday season. <laughs> now, while many experiences put you one step closer to the action, there's other experiences that bring you closer with your friends. And our friends at Harmonix have something fun to share. They didn't just stop with Rock Band VR. Check this out. Go on now, go. Walk out the door. Just turn around now, cause you're not welcome anymore. Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me with goodbye? Do you think I'd crumble? Did you think I'd lay down and die? No, no, not I. I will survive. Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I've got all my life to live, and I've got all my love to give, and I'll survive. team knew that the Gear VR was perfectly suited to allow you to belt out your favorite tunes. Whether singing solo for the in-game crowd, joining your friends for a night of fun, or showing off and dominating that karaoke stage. Well, you can sing your heart out with SingSpace coming this spring. Multiplayer doesn't have to be tied to just one device. Gamers exist on both PC and mobile, and enabling you guys to play together is extremely important. As many of you know, we've been working with High Voltage Software on a free-to-play collectible card game called Dragonfront. Dragonfront has been in closed beta for a little bit, but in case you haven't seen it yet, here it is. It is up to us to rewind time and ensure victory for a single nation. Will it be the commanding justice of scales? Perhaps it will be the necrotic hordes of Eclipse, powered by the dead. Break the tranquility with the savage power of the Thorns army. Or choose the fiery destruction of strife. Step forward into the front lines of battle. Time to choose the winning side. Dragonfront. Device play is extremely important to the longevity of our ecosystem. And Oculus is the only platform that supports this. Titles like Dragonfront and Anshar Wars are leading the way in showing that this is an opportunity to greatly expand the user base of your games. If you haven't played it yet, we are launching the open beta of Dragonfront right now. Now, VR is not just about games and entertainment. We are also investing heavily in education. One experience that we're really excited about is called Wolfbert VR, which is focusing on bringing the arts to life, redefining the way we see arts and culture in VR. Education is just one of many areas that developers are starting to explore. And to talk more about the pioneering experiences that are defining the future of virtual reality, I'd like to welcome Elena Richitsky. Thank you. Thank 
Ruth. My job and my passion in VR is working closely with content creators to understand how we can continue pushing VR forward. And expanding the creative possibilities of VR, it's incredibly important for all of us. Not only is a broader spectrum of content going to create much more interesting work, it's also going to increase our audience, which is something all of us need. And what's been interesting is that even in the past couple months, we've already begun to see inklings of VR go mainstream. I'd be surprised if this picture didn't go in the history books. We worked with President Obama, the first sitting president, to take part in a 360 VR video. And even the NBA got into the game. We worked with the NBA on a 25-minute VR sports documentary, proving that longer format narrative VR can be successful. And Henry won an Emmy. I know, it's, it's awesome. Oculus Story Studios Henry won the first primetime Emmy for an original interactive virtual reality project. And since the resurgence of VR, creators have had to completely rethink the way that we make content. And what's been personally exciting for me is to witness those magical moments when a creator has an epiphany about what is now possible. And it's happening every single day to hundreds of you, and it's continuing to grow. And as a result of those epiphanies, we've been seeing the creativity and the craft of VR continue to elevate. So we plan on investing more into these unique experiences and to making Oculus a premier destination for this type of content. And here are just some of the ways we plan on doing just that. We are incredibly pleased to announce a collaboration with Walt Disney Studios, one of the most recognizable names in storytelling. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> We're going to be working with Disney to create a series of VR experiences based on some of their most beloved characters, and it's going to be launching later this year. Oculus technology, mixed in with the magic and creativity of Disney, is going to set a higher bar for VR. And we're going to bring Blade Runner to VR. <laughs> we're going to be working with Alcon Interactive to bring VR experiences based on the Blade Runner sequel to the Oculus platform ahead of the film's release in 2017. The film was announced today. And we're also going to bring together two of the most innovative minds in music, Chris Milk and OK Go. And we're going to allow you to go inside of an OK Go music video. <laughs> and many of you felt how it might feel like to be blind with the incredibly powerful project Notes on Blindness. But soon, you're going to be able to experience what it's like to see through an animal's eyes with Marshmallow Laser Feast's interactive project in the eyes of the animal. And if, you get, and if you get stressed out in case you have to speak in front of over 2,000 people live, well, you can take a breath and relax, because we're going to help bring Deepak Chopra's VR meditation app to the Oculus platform created by Weaver. <laughs> and many of us really understand the power that VR documentaries have had in bringing issues that once felt distant much closer, which is why we're honored to have the UN VR app on the Oculus Store. It's going to be rolling out VR documentaries based on humanitarian and global issues throughout the year. We also know we need to continue broadening the definitions of VR and to continue pushing it forward. And some of that is going to come from all of you, but part of it is going to come from the next generation and VR natives, the ones who natively grow up with it which is why we're also excited to announce Oculus NextGen. We're going to be enabling content creation curriculums across the country with top institutions. And this is really just the beginning for us. How exciting is it that we're laying the foundation and collectively creating the language of VR? And now, I'd like to bring back Brendan. <laughs> This next year is going to be huge. The industry as a whole is starting to take shape. There's literally billions of dollars being invested in VR right now. VR's future has never been brighter. Together, we're all on a path to make this the next great computing platform. 
Everyone in this room are the pioneers and the co-founders of this movement. We hope this morning has inspired you to continue to push the boundaries, to continue to think outside of the box. From the accessibility of Gear VR to the best-in-class immersion of Rift and Touch. And now the groundbreaking work that we're doing on standalone VR and inside-out tracking. Our promise is to deliver the best VR products, the best VR platform, and the innovations that continue to drive this industry forward. To share more about the future of VR, please welcome Michael Abrash. I'm doing all right, getting good grades. The future's so bright. I gotta wear shades. I gotta wear shades. Good morning. You know, getting up here and talking with you each year is something that I really love. It truly is one of the things that I look forward to. But I have to tell you something. I am sick as a dog. In fact, they're going to be bringing tea out for me, and I apologize in advance because I'll probably have to stop occasionally, take a sip, and try to keep from coughing. Really, I should be home lying in bed. But this is the year that Consumer VR finally launched, and I wouldn't have missed this for anything. It's the culmination of a series of amazing and highly improbable events that nobody would have predicted just five years ago. And yet, this is just the beginning. The really interesting stuff is yet to come. So today, I'd like to talk about the future, starting with one of my favorite quotes. Pretty soon, computers will be fast. I started a game developers conference talk with that quote 20 years ago. And I think you'd all agree that computers still aren't fast enough. And yet, they're more than 10,000 times faster now than they were then. We humans have an odd cognitive bias that seems designed to make us perpetually unsatisfied. If I had handed you a system that was even 10 times faster in 1996, it would have been a miracle on the order of loaves and fishes. And yet, all you can think today as you try to hit 90 frames per second is that you wish computers were just a little bit faster. There's a wonderful future, always moving ahead of us, just out of reach. And yet, that cognitive bias serves a very useful function. It gives meaning to our work. We don't often stop and think about it, but what is it that makes work rewarding? Doing interesting stuff and earning a living is necessary, but not sufficient. Truly satisfying work requires a meaningful narrative, one that successfully answers the question, what do I want to accomplish in order to make this a life well spent? I'm pretty sure most of you would have the same answer to that question that I do, to make a difference, to change the world for the better. And making that happen is all about seeing a brighter future ahead. I didn't start out thinking that way. I was a grad student in energy management and policy at Penn when I discovered personal computers by accident and found that they were way more interesting than home insulation programs. <laughs> this was before PCs were a big thing, so I was far more concerned with finding interesting work that paid decently than thinking about the future. And, in fact, it took another 15 years and a meeting with John Carmack before that changed. I told part of that story at the first Oculus Connect, but it's worth telling the full story today. In 1993, I was the manager of the graphics team for the first version of Windows NT. A friend showed me the leaked alpha of Doom. I was blown away, and I sent mail to John saying so. John said we should have lunch next time he was in Seattle, and we did, and he offered me the opportunity to work at id. I said no. I was doing interesting work, and I had a lot of stock options. <laughs> a year passed. Sometime during that year, I took my daughter to a bookstore, while she was looking at books, I browsed through the science fiction section, and I noticed an interesting-looking book called Snow Crash. I didn't have much time to read in those days, but I bought it anyway. And partway through it, I had the sudden insight that a lot of the VR in it could actually work. Maybe not right then or quite the way that Neil Stevenson described it, but close enough at some point in the foreseeable future. And then John visited again. We ate a Thai chef, which miraculously is still there today. I knew John was going to ask me to join him again, and I knew I was going to say no again. My work was still interesting, and now that NT had shipped, I had a lot more stock options. <laughs> a 
But instead, John sat down and started spinning his vision of the future, of how he was going to enable people to run their own persistent servers, customize them, extend them, link them together, and over time, a kind of cyberspace would emerge. He talked for two hours, and as he spoke, his vision resonated with Snow Crash in my mind, and I could actually feel the shape of the future emerging. By the time he finally got around to asking me to join him, that future had taken hold of my imagination. For the first time in my life, I had a sense of purpose beyond just writing great code, and I signed on to help make it happen. It was, by far, the worst financial decision of my life. <laughs> Microsoft stock tripled over the next two years, and then it doubled and it doubled again. And yet, I don't regret my decision for a moment. That vision of the future motivated me to do something challenging and exciting that changed its part of the world in a big way and touched a lot of people's lives. Likewise, I think the biggest reason we're all working on VR now is because of our vision of what VR will become. As VR progresses, that vision will keep evolving too, and we'll always wish it was just a little bit better. But at the same time, all our efforts will be collectively taking VR to the next level. My day-to-day -day work is incredibly interesting, but knowing that I'm helping to shape the future is a big part of what makes these the good old days for me, and I hope it is for you too. Today, I'm going to talk about that future as far ahead as I can see into the fog of time, which is about five years. Science fiction writer El Sprague de Camp said, it does not pay a profit to be too specific. <laughs> Wise advice indeed. However, about three years ago, I made very specific predictions about what VR would be like in two years, and they seem to have pretty much come true. So, emboldened by that, I'm foolishly going to ignore de Camp's advice and make another set of specific predictions. <laughs> I am, however, only going to make a certain type of prediction about the evolution of underlying VR platform technologies such as displays and computer vision. I'm not going to talk about killer apps or what else might be running on that VR platform in five years for a couple of reasons. One reason is that platform technology is what I know the most about because it's what Oculus Research has been focusing on. Content can do only what the underlying technology makes possible, and our mission is to drive that enabling technology forward so that content creators like you can work their magic on top of it. The other reason I'm not going to talk about future VR applications is that I honestly have no idea what we're all going to be using VR for in five years. That doesn't bother me in the least. The potential of VR is obvious, and all of you are already well down the path to creating the apps that will make VR part of our everyday lives. Our goal at Oculus Research is to create the package of technologies that will enable you to do that, and that's what I'm going to pull the curtain back on a little bit today. Frankly, Talking about this in public wasn't an easy decision to make. However, all of you are working on VR right now, at the very beginning, out of faith that it will become incredibly cool and important. And I think you deserve a glimpse of just how bright the future you're working toward is. Of course, I may be wrong on specifics. In fact, I guarantee that I will be wrong about at least some of them. But I'm highly confident that the overall trend is there. Enough of these predictions will come true so that VR five years from now will make today's VR look like something out of prehistory. One day, years from now, you'll fire up your original Rift, just for old time's sake, and it'll bring back great memories. But you'll wonder where your hands are. You'll be oblivious to the real world around you, and it won't look or sound quite as amazing as you remember. You'll go back to your spiffy new Rift, and in that moment, you'll realize just how far we've come in five short years and that you were part of making that happen. And then, of course, you'll start wondering why it's not as good as the holodeck yet. <laughs> so let's look into the future. The technologies I'll discuss fall into several main areas. Optics and displays, graphics, eye tracking, audio, interaction, ergonomics, and computer vision. I'm going to talk about each of these separately, although many of the technologies interact closely, as I'll note in places. I'll talk about where I think each might be in five years and some of the challenges involved in getting there. My predictions are for what will happen on the leading edge, which will be the high end of PC VR. 
These innovations will make their way to mobile VR over time, but power, compute, and pricing advantages mean the PC will provide the most sophisticated VR experience for a long time. What you're going to hear is what I think and hope VR will be in five years, but everything I'll discuss is still far out research at this point and may or may not ever show up in a product. So with the clear understanding that these are just my opinions and that there are no guarantees, let's peer into the future. We're primarily visual creatures, so delivering the right photons to the right places on the retinas at the right time is a pillar of VR. Here's where we are right now. Here's what our visual system is actually capable of. As you can see, there's a long way to go. We'd ideally have eight times the pixel density on each axis, three times the field of view, and variable focus. It's certainly going to take a while to get there. How far can we get in five years? Here are my predictions. Panel resolution is the easiest one, since there's been steady improvement in that for years, and it's fairly easy to extrapolate ahead. I think we'll be around 4K by 4K per eye in five years. However, there's an interesting trade-off in how that resolution gets used. Pixel density is a function of both resolution and field of view. We could have a higher pixel density image with a narrower field of view, or a wider field of view with a lower pixel density image. It all depends on what field of view is achievable and how compelling a wider field of view turns out to be. It's my guess that a wider field of view will be very compelling, greatly increasing presence, and that VR will head toward the widest possible virtual image. Given that, I am predicting a 140 degree field of view, resulting in approximately 30 pixels per degree. Not as sharp as 2020 vision, but good enough to pass a driver's license test. A wider field of view with higher resolution will require a breakthrough in optics. For now, lenses of the sort currently used in the Rift have fundamental limitations with respect to image quality, and both Fresnel's and normal fisheye lenses can't get much past 100 degrees without unacceptable distortion. So new optics technology will be required. I don't know what that enabling technology will be, but I'm confident that we'll find a way to break out well past 100 degrees. The final area for optics and display is depth of focus. The lenses of our eyes normally change shape in order to focus at the correct depth for whatever object we're currently looking at. However, the lenses in VR headsets have a fixed focus at about two meters. So in VR, our eyes would ideally stay focused around two meters, even if we're looking at something right in front of our nose. That's actually great for a presbyope like me, since my eyes are, in fact, permanently focused around two meters. But for those of you with eyes that can actually change focus, it's less ideal. Your eyes end up focused closer than two meters when looking at something up close in VR, causing both near and far objects to be blurred. Is this a big problem? Clearly not, since this is how the Rift works today, and we all use the Rift a lot with good results. But would it be good to fix? Sure, particularly as resolution increases, making blurring more evident. Anything that makes virtual viewing more like the real world will increase comfort and the ability to stay in VR for long periods. So how might we address this? That's an open area of research. There are several possibilities, including holographic displays, light field displays, multifocal displays, and varifocal displays, but none of them are close to being good enough yet, especially in head-mountable form. At this point, I don't know which of these approaches will work, if any, but the problem feels tractable. So I think that one way or another, VR will have good support for depth of focus in five years. The cumulative effect of depth of focus, higher resolution, wider field of view, and better optics will be VR that is highly comfortable, amazingly realistic, and deeply convincing. Given a great display, the obvious next requirement is graphics to drive that display. And that's not a trivial undertaking when it involves 16 megapixels per eye, more than an order of magnitude more than today at 90 hertz. As it happens, most of those pixels are wasted at any given time because the eye has only a very small area of full resolution. This area, called the fovea, is a mere three degrees across, the size of your thumb at arm's length, and resolution falls off rapidly away from the fovea. The obvious solution is to render pixels with variable density across the scene to match the eye's resolution. This is called foveated rendering, and it can potentially reduce the number of pixels rendered by an order of magnitude or even more. 
I'm sure all of you can appreciate how much easier it would be to hold frame rate if you only had to render one-tenth the pixels. There are a couple of major challenges with foveated rendering. The first challenge is developing a rendering approach that can take full advantage of foveation. The traditional approach involves multiple passes and drawing a lot more pixels than needed. It may be necessary to redesign the entire graphics pipeline in order to realize the full potential. The second challenge is that foveated rendering requires virtually perfect eye tracking, which I'll discuss next. So there are certainly obstacles to overcome, but my prediction is that foveated rendering will be a core VR technology in five years. Foveated rendering has a critical dependency, however. It can only become a core technology if eye tracking is completely reliable across the full range of eye motion for the entire user population. Because if it fails, visual quality will deteriorate drastically. A number of other potential breakthroughs have the same dependence on great eye tracking. You might think, how hard can it be to track a single convex organ in a confined space? And indeed, when we started Oculus Research, I assumed eye tracking just required some solid engineering. Two years later, I think that's true for tracking well enough to give avatars eyes. But it turns out the tracking at the level required for foveated rendering is not a solved problem at all. One reason is that pupil tracking is a key eye tracking technique like so. Here you can see the pupils are being tracked correctly. But pupils vary wildly, including this and this. And of course, pupils also change size and can even change shape. And here you can see they're not even the same size. Glint tracking off the cornea can help. But then there's the problem of eyelids. Not to mention fitting enough illuminators and cameras into a compact headset and positioning them so that tracking works across the full range of eye motion with deep eye sockets, flat faces, bulging eyes, and LASIK, and is 100% reliable in all those cases. Worse, the eye is not nearly as rigid as you think. The motion at the end is a little subtle, so let's look at it again. Watch the shape of the pupil as the eye stops. This is a problem because what we really want to know is where the image is on the retina. Tracking the outside of the eye can only give us an approximation of that. Ideally, we track the retina itself, but doing that in a headset across the full range of eye motion would require inventing a whole new type of eye tracking technology. Getting to extremely accurate, completely robust eye tracking may only require gathering a lot more data and doing a lot more engineering. Or it may require real research and new technology, but either way, Great eye tracking is so central to the future of VR that I believe it will be solved five years from now. Although, I have to admit, it is the greatest single risk factor for my predictions. Audio is pretty straightforward. Five years from now, you'll be able to quickly and easily generate a personalized head-related transfer function, or HRTF, in the comfort of your own home. HRTFs describe how sound bounces off and diffracts around the head and especially the ears, and personalized HRTFs will provide the same sense of direction and distance for virtual sound that we have for real sound. There will also be technology for modeling the propagation of sound around virtual spaces, how sounds reflect, diffract, and interfere as they bounce around, so virtual rooms will feel much more convincing, even though you may not consciously know why. However, while the theory behind audio propagation is well understood, the computational demands of working implementations are so high that only certain sorts of constrained virtual spaces with limited movement of sound sources and listeners will be practical for propagation in five years. But those instances will be highly compelling and will point the way to steadily improving audio in the future. So far, we've only talked about improving our perception of the virtual world. What about interacting with it? Oculus Touch is so good that I think that it and its descendants are going to be the state of the art for at least five years and maybe much longer. It's quite possible that touch-like controllers could be the mouse of VR and still be the primary interaction technology 40 years from now. The only thing I can see displacing touch-like controllers is the ability to use your hands as direct physical manipulators, as you do in the real world. And I don't see that happening in the next five years because it involves haptic and kinematic technology that isn't even on the distant horizon today. 
I do think that hand tracking and rendering will become a standard part of VR in the next five years and will be a welcome addition for social act interaction. Touch's hand presence is a great addition for VR experience, but avatars that reflect your exact hand movements will be even more personal and expressive. It will also be useful to be able to use hand gestures to control simple interfaces and perform lightweight direct manipulation when you don't want to bother using touch or the simple input device. For example, when you just want to watch a movie in VR. Typing on virtual keyboards overlaid on real surfaces or even floating in midair will also become practical and will be handy. But without haptics and kinematics, the applications of virtual hands will be limited compared to the real world. So my prediction is that in five years, we'll see good avatar hand tracking and gesture-based simple interface control, but touch-like controllers will still be the dominant mode for sophisticated VR interactions. In an ideal world, we wouldn't even strap a device onto our head. We'd just walk into the holodeck. We won't be able to do that any time in the foreseeable future, and no, we're not working on it. <laughs> but we can work on making the device more comfortable and the experience better. Ways I think that will happen over five years include reduced weight, better weight distribution, and more convenient handling of prescription correction. But the biggest change I expect to see at the high end is wireless headsets. This is not just a comfort and convenience issue, although it certainly is that. The key is that in conjunction with the computer vision advances I'll discuss next, eliminating the tether will allow you to move freely about the real world while in VR, yet still have access to the processing power of a PC. The challenge here is developing a wireless link with enough bandwidth to meet the needs of VR. There's no existing consumer electronics link that's up to the task at current resolutions, let alone at the 4K by 4K resolution I expect in five years. This is one reason foveated rendering is so important. Without the pixel reduction it provides, it will be very difficult to go wireless on the PC. Most of the technologies I've talked about so far is focused on matching digital input and output to the human perceptual and motor systems. Since that's the only way to get information into and out of our brain until someone comes up with a way to jack in, that, all of that is absolutely critical for a great virtual experience. But there's a real world out there on the other side of our perceptual system, and bringing that into VR would be hugely compelling. We'd be able to move around safely and confidently, pick up coffee mugs, see who just came into the room, be anywhere on Earth we wanted to be, and interact with anyone on the planet. There would no longer be a sharp line between VR and reality. Instead, we'd have a mixed reality that would let us choose whatever elements of each we wanted at any time. I'll call this mixed reality augmented VR. There are many, many aspects to making that work, but the two main themes are sensing and reconstructing the real world in general and virtual humans. Reconstructing the real world is challenging, but doable. You can go out right now and have someone scan a space and give you a model of it. Doing that with a consumer device in real time is another matter entirely, and yet that's what's needed to make augmented VR really useful. My prediction is that five years from now, augmented VR will be an integral part of virtual reality, and that it will transform VR into something that will be used for longer and for many more things than it can be today. While there are many unsolved problems and a lot of research and engineering still needs to be done, augmented VR is so important that I'm confident all the obstacles will be overcome and that the boundary between virtual reality and real reality will progressively blur over the next five years. Augmented VR will be quite different from the mixed reality that's possible with see-through AR glasses. With augmented VR, we will have a full model of the real scene and complete control over every pixel. So we'll be able to modify reality and mix it with the virtual world in literally any way we want. Any part of the scene could be virtual or real, and we could also mix the two closely. For example, changing the colors and textures of real surfaces or warping real textures across virtual surfaces. We could even send a model of a space to someone somewhere else so that location itself becomes virtual. And what would be even cooler would be interacting with them in that space. Other people are the most interesting thing in the world to most of us, and I believe that the development of virtual humans is going to be the single most important factor in making VR a part of our everyday lives, thanks to the social interaction that will enable. It's also perhaps the single most challenging aspect of virtual reality. People are non-rigid and physically highly complex. There are more than 25 degrees of freedom just in one hand. The face is even more complex, 
And we are incredibly sensitive to the subtleties of gestures and expressions, as well as the fine movements of eyes. The bar here is extremely high, and the technology for real-time capture and reproduction of humans with consumer technology is nowhere near that bar today. At the same time, tremendous progress has been made over the last few years in all aspects of virtual humans. Today, we can do near-perfect hand tracking, but it requires retroreflector studded gloves and lots of cameras. In five years, though, it should be possible to have avatar hands that are close to this level. Faces are incredibly subtle and complex to reproduce, especially with a headset on, but the technology is getting there. And real-time markerless body tracking is now a realistic goal. As you can see, machine learning makes it possible to do accurate pose estimation over a very wide variety of circumstances. <laughs> there will be a huge amount of work on virtual humans over the next five years, and we'll certainly see a number of systems that provide a limited experience of being with another human being, basically improved versions of the toy box demo. But like toy box, they will be on the other side of the uncanny valley from truly human avatars. And while they'll be entertaining and useful, you will never for one moment feel like you're in the presence of a true human, much less a specific, unique individual. I think this area is so hard that five years from now, virtual humans will be widely used for social interaction and highly entertaining, but will not yet be convincingly human. And the real breakthrough will be yet to come. So that's a look at the underlying technologies of VR and how I think they'll evolve over the next five years. The obvious next question, of course, is if I'm right, what does that imply for the VR experience five years from now? I said I wasn't going to talk about killer apps or what else might be built on the underlying technology, but I will talk about one application because it's one I personally want and expect to be using in five years. And it shows how all the platform technologies come together to create something that's greater than the sum of its parts. I talked about this application last year. It's a virtual workspace, a VR environment that you could configure any way you wanted, with virtual screens, holograms, whiteboards, and whatever, then switch between configurations instantly. Done well enough, that's the most productive solo work environment I can imagine. And then if we add virtual humans, it would become an amazingly productive group work environment as well. As just one simple example, imagine having a whiteboard session with any number of people you want, no matter where they are, and with an infinite number of whiteboards of any size capable of showing anything from text to images to videos to holograms, all easily searched and archived. Let's look at what it would take to make that happen. First, we need enough resolution and good enough image quality so that virtual monitors can replace real monitors. That obviously requires very high-res displays and much improved optics, but that's just the start. It also requires the ability to render at that high resolution and to transmit the data over a wireless link because you won't want to have to deal with a tether all day while you work, which means we need foveated rendering, which may mean we need a new graphics pipeline and certainly means we need great eye tracking. Next, we need to be able to do augmented VR because we want to be able to see our surroundings in real time so we can move about and interact with our desk and chair and likely also our keyboard, mouse, and beverage of choice. We also need to be able to see our hands in order to be able to interact with the real world and our bodies so that we can move around with confidence. All that takes great computer vision. And if we're going to be doing work with our hands, we're going to want depth of focus support in order to make that comfortable for hours of use per day. And we'll want proper spatialization and propagation of virtual sound so that virtual objects will sound as real as they look. That's great for solo work. Teamwork requires even more. Obviously, it will require avatars, the more convincing, the better. Less obviously, it will require a wider field of view so that everyone in a meeting can see each other. That's critical for social interaction, as are voices that sound like they're coming from the right people in the right places. Finally, we'll want to be able to share our environments with each other, both for social purposes and because physical objects will often be important to the discussion. In short, a virtual workspace that makes us more productive than the real world requires pretty much everything I've talked about today. Advances in each of the technology areas by themselves will be useful, but together these advances will make it possible to create a system that will revolutionize the way we work. 
Not all of that will be in place in five years, but I think we'll be far enough along so that we will start doing real work in VR. And while the virtual workspace is the only VR application that I can envision that clearly, I'm highly confident that the advances I foresee over the next five years, combined with the hard work of all of you, will likewise revolutionize gaming, entertainment, education, communications, and more. Together, we're creating the platform that will be the basis for the next few decades of how we work, play, and interact. I'd like to close with one more story. In the summer of 2011, I met with Atman Binstock, now chief architect of Oculus, in this coffee shop in Kirkland, Washington, to try to convince him to come work on VR, AR with me. VR actually came later. His first question was, why now? And that was pretty easy to answer. I pointed out how half a dozen technologies were coming together that would collectively make AR feasible. His second question was, why me? As Ottman put it in his blog post when he joined Oculus, after all, if the technology was really ready, surely people more capable than me would figure it out. But Michael convinced me that this was basically the myth of technological inevitability. The idea that because technologies were possible, they would just naturally happen. Instead, the way technological revolutions actually happen involves smart people working hard on the right problems at the right time. And if I wanted a revolution, and I thought I was capable of contributing, I should be actively pushing it forward. Ottman decided that he did want to make a difference and jumped in with both feet to make it happen. And there is no question that VR is much farther along today, coincidentally, five years later, because of that choice. <laughs> Likewise, everyone in this room has jumped in to make VR happen, and our reward is that we are on the leading edge of one of the most important technological revolutions of our lifetime. Thanks to all our efforts, VR is going to leap ahead over the next five years. There's a line in Ottman's quote that I like so much that I'm going to repeat it. And if there's one thing you take away today, this should be it. The way technological revolutions actually happen involves smart people working hard on the right problems at the right time. Take a good look around this room, because when it comes to the future of VR, that, my friends, is us. Thank you.